Welcome to Project Management. In this video, I will talk about risk management, meaning what can go wrong in a project and how we should deal with it. Project managers should understand that risks are inherent in projects. Deliveries are delayed, accidents happen, people get sick and absent from work, etc. Risks are uncertain or chance events that no amount of planning can overcome. If these events occur, they may have a positive or negative effect on project objectives. For example, equipment malfunction could negatively impact the project and cause delays. Unexpected price reduction in materials could positively impact the project in terms of the cost. However, we focus more on the negative effects of risks in the risk management process. Watch this video titled 10 Public Stunts That Went Horribly Wrong. These examples highlight some risks associated with business marketing and commercial projects. Risk management is an attempt to recognize and manage potential and unforeseen troubles that may occur when the project is implemented. Risk management will answer questions like, what can go wrong? How to minimize the risk event's impact or consequences? What can be done before the risk event occurs? What to do when an event occurs? Risk management is a proactive rather than reactive approach to deal with potential and unforeseen troubles. It reduces surprises and negative consequences, provides better control of the project, and improves chances of completing the project on time and on budget. Please note that risks from external sources, such as inflation, exchange rates, economic depression, and government regulations are often referred to as threats. External risks are usually considered before the decision to go ahead with the project. Therefore, they are not within the project manager or team member's responsibility area when doing risk management, and we will not discuss those in this video. This graph shows the general relationship among risk, time, and cost. The vertical axis on the left shows the risk level from low to high. The horizontal axis shows different phases of the project life cycle, including defining, planning, executing, and delivery. The vertical axis on the right shows the cost impact of the risk event on the project from low to high. There are two curves. The chance of a risk event occurring is represented by the blue curve, and the cost to deal with the risk event is represented by the red curve. We can see that the chance of a risk event occurring is greatest in the defining, planning, and early executing phases of the project. The cost impact of a risk event is less if the event occurs earlier rather than later because it allows the project manager to take corrective actions and bring the project back to normal. In contrast, the chance of a risk event gradually decreasing toward the end of the project. However, if such an event occurs at the later stage of executing or delivering the final product to the customer, it will leave you very little time and resources you can use. As a result, the cost will be very high. An example of this case is the 1999 NASA Mars Climate Orbiter failure. Watch this video. If the errors were found before the man-made satellite was launched to space, it probably would just cost a few engineers time to get it fixed, instead of losing the $125 million probe. The risk management process includes four different steps. Step 1 is risk identification, that is, analyzing the project to identify sources of risks. After a list of known risks are identified, we go to step 2, risk assessment, where we assess risks in terms of the severity of impact, likelihood of occurring, and controllability. The assessment results will be used in step 3 to develop a risk response plan. The risk response plan will be executed in step 4 when risk events occurs, and it will be adjusted for new risks. 
we will introduce these steps in sequence. In step 1, the goal of risk identification is to generate a list of possible risks through brainstorming. Input from customers, sponsors, subcontractors, vendors, and other stakeholders should be solicited. Participants are encouraged to keep an open mind at this stage and generate as many probable risks as possible during brainstorming. Although it's impossible to enumerate all the risks, it's still beneficial to be as comprehensive as possible because risks may materialize in many unthinkable ways. Watch these two short videos about this. The first one is titled, Family Stuck in Chromage Codes 911. And the second one is titled, Security Experts Find Serious Flaws in Amazon Key. After the potential risks have been identified, later during the assessment phase, participants will have a chance to analyze and filter out unreasonable risks. The risk breakdown structure can be used to identify risks. A risk breakdown structure is a hierarchical representation that helps the project team consider the full range of sources from which individual project risks may arise. This is an example of risk breakdown structure. In this project, risks are grouped into four different categories, organizational, project management, technical, and external. Organizational risks may come from resources, funding, priority, etc. For example, the organization may not have the required resources or funding for the project. Project and management risks may come from planning, estimating, controlling, and communication. For example, poor time and cost estimates and inadequate team communication may lead to project failure. Technical risks may come from project scope, requirements definition, technology, complex technical interfaces, product quality, etc. External risks may come from subcontractors and suppliers, government regulations, market behavior, customer demand, and weather, and so on. Use of the risk breakdown structure reduces the chance a risk event will be missed. When done well, the number of risks identified can be overwhelming and a bit discouraging. It is important that project managers set the right tone so team members regain confidence. In step 2 of the risk management process, the identified potential risks will be assessed to estimate their likelihood and impact. Risk event likelihood can be represented by numbers between 0% and 100%. It can also be represented by words from very unlikely to almost certainly. Similarly, potential impact can be represented by a numerical weight between 1 and 10 or from low to high. For example, the risk of a project manager being struck by lightning at a worksite would have major negative impact on the project, but the likelihood is so low it's not worth of consideration. Conversely, people do change jobs. So, an event like the loss of key project personnel would have not only an adverse impact but also a high likelihood of occurring in some organizations. This table shows an example of how the impact of risk event is measured. It defines conditions for quantifying negative impacts. We can measure impact in terms of project time, cost, and scope. For this project, if the risk event will cause a time increase that is less than 20%, then its impact is low. If it will cause a time increase that is greater than 20% but less than 40%, then the impact is moderate. If the time increase is higher than 40%, then the impact is high. If a risk event will cause a cost increase that is less than 10%, then its weight is 1 or its label is low. If it will cause a cost increase that is higher than 10% but less than 20%, then its weight is 2 or its label is moderate. If it will cause a cost increase that is higher than 20%, then its weight is 3 or its label is high. 
Similarly, if the risk event will cause a minor scope decrease, then its impact is low. If the final project deliverable is effectively useless due to the risk event, then its impact is high. Scenario analysis are commonly used in various risk assessment forms. This is a simplified example of a risk assessment form used in an information system project. It involves the upgrade from Windows 7 to Windows 10. This table lists three different risk events. The users may have to go through a long learning process to get used to the new Windows 10 interface during the conversion period. The likelihood of interface-related problems is 4 out of 5. The impact is 4 out of 5, and the detection difficulty is 4 out of 5, meaning this type of problem is difficult to detect. Some users may occasionally experience system freeze when starting the computer. The likelihood is low, only 2 out of 5, but the impact is high, like 5, and it's rather difficult to detect because many reasons may cause a system freeze problem, and the problem only occur occasionally, and sometimes they are not reproducible. The rest of the table can be read in a similar way. A model that can be used to evaluate the risk level of an event is called the Failure Mode and Effects Analysis, or the FMEA model. According to the FMEA model, the risk value is equal to the likelihood times the impact times the detection difficulty. Using this equation, we can calculate the risk values of these three risk events. The first one is 64, the second one is 50, and the third one is 36. Based on these numbers, we may say that interface problems have the highest risk, then system freezing, and followed by user backlash. Some organizations find it useful to categorize the severity of different risks into some form of risk assessment matrix. The matrix is typically structured around the impact and likelihood of the risk event. For example, the risk matrix in this figure consists of a 5x5 five five array of elements, with each element representing a different set of impact and likelihood values. The matrix is divided into red, yellow, and green zones, representing major, moderate, and minor risks, respectively. The red zone is located on the top right corner of the matrix, high impact and high likelihood. The green zone is located on the bottom left corner, low impact and low likelihood. The yellow zone is between the red zone and the green zone. Using the Windows 10 project again as an example, interface problems and system freezing would be placed in the red zone major risks, while user backlash would be placed in the yellow zone, moderate risk. The risk severity matrix provides a basis for prioritizing which risks to address. Red zone risks receive first priority, followed by yellow zone risks. Green zone risks are typically considered insignificant and can be ignored unless their status changes. After risks have been assessed in step 2 of the risk management process, a decision must be made regarding which response is appropriate for the specific event. Responses to risk can be classified as mitigating, avoiding, transferring, and accepting. Mitigating means reducing the likelihood an adverse event will occur or reducing the impact of the risk event. For example, Prototyping and testing are frequently used to prevent problems from surfacing later in a project. Other examples of reducing the probability of risks occurring are investing in upfront safety training and choosing high quality materials and equipment. Avoiding means changing the project plan to eliminate the risk or conditions. For example, adopting proven technology instead of experimental technology can eliminate technical failure. Choosing a Japanese supplier as opposed to a Vietnam supplier would eliminate quality defects in key parts needed for a product. Transferring means paying a premium like warranty, insurance, or bonds to pass the risk to another party. Accepting means making a conscious decision to accept the risks, such as an earthquake or flood, with slim chance.
or some minor risks that can be absorbed. A contingency plan is an alternative plan that will be used if a possible foreseen risk event actually occurs. A contingency plan contains a set of actions that will reduce or mitigate the negative impact or consequences of risk event. A key difference between a risk response plan and a contingency plan is that a response action is taken before the risk occurs, while a contingency plan only goes into effect after the risk occurred. Not having a contingency plan will lead to rushed decisions and decisions made under pressure, which will be potentially dangerous and costly. Conditions for activating the implementation of the contingency plan should be decided and clearly documented. All contingency plans should be communicated to team members so that surprise and resistance are minimized. A risk response matrix is useful for summarizing how the project team plans to manage risks that have been identified. Again, the Windows 10 project is used to illustrate this kind of matrix. For example, to mitigate the system freeze risk, a prototype will be developed and thoroughly tested. If there is a system freeze and the freeze lasts for more than 30 minutes, then the system will be reinstalled. JSON is responsible for monitoring the contingency conditions and taking actions. The response, contingency plan, triggering conditions, and persons responsible are listed in this table for other risk events as well. Climbing Mount Everest can provide some insights into project risk management. A well-established contingency plan is useless if it's not followed. Under fair conditions, it takes 18 hours to make the round trip to the top and back to the base camp. Climbers leave at 1 a.m. in order to make it back before nightfalls and getting totally exhausted. The key is to establish a contingency plan in case the climbers encounter hard going or the weather changes. Local guides usually establish a predetermined turnaround time at 2 p.m. to ensure a safe return no matter how close the climbers are to the top. However, many lives have been lost by failing to adhere to the turn back time and pushing forward to the top. Watch this video and learn some facts about climbing Mount Everest. Risk management generally focuses on what can go wrong on a project. The flip side is opportunity management, which focuses on what can go right on a project. An opportunity is an event that can have a positive impact on project objectives. For example, unusually favorable weather can accelerate the construction work, and few price drops may create savings that could be used to add value to a project. The project manager may use four different types of response to manage an opportunity. Exploiting means seeking to eliminate the uncertainty associated with an opportunity to ensure that it definitely happens. For example, assigning your best people to a critical burst activity to shorten the project completion time. Sharing means allocating some or all of the ownership of an opportunity to another party who is best able to capture the opportunity for the benefit of the project. For example, Establishing incentives for external contractors who participate in continuous improvement activities. Enhancing means taking action to increase the probability and the positive impact of an opportunity. For example, choosing site location based on favorable weather patterns or choosing raw materials that are likely to decline in price. Accepting means being willing to take advantage of an opportunity if it occurs but not taking any actions to pursue it. Contingency funds are established to cover project risks, no matter whether they are identified risks or unidentified risks. The size and amount of contingency reserves depend on uncertainty inherent in the project. In practice, contingencies run from 1-10% to of the total budget for projects that are similar to past projects. However, in unique and high-tech projects, you may even find contingencies running in the range of 20 to 60 percent. 
The contingency funds are typically divided into budget and management reserve funds. Budget reserves are linked to the identified risks of specific work packages. The management reserves are funds to be used to cover major unforeseen risks at the project level. This table shows the development of a contingency fund estimate for a hypothetical software development project. There are three major activities in the project. There are design, coding, and testing, listed on the first column. The budget baseline for design is $250,000. The budget reserve is 4% of the baseline, which is $10,000. Though the total budget for this activity is $260,000. The total budget for the second activity, coding, is $440,000. And for the third activity, testing, is $52,000. So the subtotal for these three activities is $752,000. Note how budget and management reserves are kept separate. The management reserve is $50,000 for the entire project. So the total project budget is subtotal plus the management reserve. The result is $802,000. Although the budget reserve and management reserve are included in the total budget, it's assumed that there is a high probability these funds will never be used. Contingency funds are established to absorb unplanned costs. Similarly, time buffers are used to cushion against potential delays in the project schedule. The more uncertain the project, the more time should be reserved for the schedule. Time buffers are added to activities with severe risks. They could be added to merge activities that are prone to delays due to one or more preceding activities being late. They could be added to non-critical activities to reduce the likelihood that they will create another critical path. They could also be added to activities that require scarce resources to ensure that the resources will be available when needed. The results of the first three steps of the risk management process are summarized in a formal document often called the risk register. A risk register details all identified risks, including descriptions, category, probability of occurring, impact, responses, contingency plans, owners, and current status. The risk register will be used in the last step of the risk management process, which is called risk control. Risk control involves executing the risk response strategy, monitoring triggering events, initiating contingency plans, and watching for new risks. Establishing a change management system to deal with events that require formal changes in project scope, budget, or schedule is an essential element of risk control. Changes come from many sources such as the customer, the project manager, team members, and the occurrence of risk events. Most changes fall into three categories. One is the scope changes in the form of redesign or a new feature requested by the customer. Another one is those improvement changes suggested by project team members. The third type of changes is the implementation of contingency plans after a risk event occurred. Because change is inevitable, a well-defined change review and control process should be set up early in the project planning cycle. The change control process is described in this flowchart. Change originates means the customer or team member or another stakeholder realized that a change needs to be made. Then they will submit a change request. Then a group of stakeholders that may be affected by the potential changes will review the request and make a decision. If the change is approved, then the project plan will be updated and the information will be distributed for actions. One of the benefits of using a change management system is that trivial changes are discouraged by the formal process. Another benefit is that costs of changes are maintained in a log. Allocation and use of budget and management reserve funds can be easily tracked. Also, responsibility for change implementation is clarified. Effects of changes is visible to all parties involved. 
Next, we will introduce another way of doing project network analysis. It's called Program Evaluation and Review Technique, a PERT. PERT is almost identical to the critical path method, except it considers uncertainty. PERT assumes each activity duration has a range that follows a statistical distribution. It uses three time estimates, optimistic, pessimistic, and most likely to represent each activity's duration. For each activity, we denote the optimistic activity time by A, the pessimistic activity time by B, and the most likely activity time by M. So A will be less than or equal to M, which is less than or equal to B. The weighted duration for that activity is denoted by lowercase letter t sub e, and it's equal to a plus 4 times m plus b divided by 6. The standard deviation of this duration is denoted by sigma sub t e, and it's equal to b minus a over 6. Part analysis assumes that no matter what the durations of the project's activities are, the critical path doesn't change. The project duration is represented by a normal distribution. The expected value of the project duration, capital letter T sub E, and it's the sum of the durations of all the activities on the critical path. The standard deviation of the project duration is the square root of the sum of the variances of all the activities on the critical path. The normal distribution is represented by this notation shown at the top right corner, where capital TE is the mean, and sigma is a standard deviation. The standard distribution is shown in this figure. We can calculate the probability that the project will be completed by TS using PERT, where TS is the scheduled or planned project duration. The probability is equal to the shaded area under this blue curve and right bounded by TS. There are many online tools that can help us find their value. Let's see an example. This table lists all the information we need to build a project network. This project has five activities, A through E. Their predecessor information is provided in the second column. For each activity, the optimistic, most likely, and pessimistic duration estimates are represented by A, M, and B, respectively. Little t sub e is a weighted average of each activity's duration, and sigma t e shown in the last column is a standard deviation. Based on such information, we can build a project network like this. A is the starting node, and E is the end node. The critical path is A, B, C, E. The expected duration of the project is capital T, E, which is 90 days. Let's mark these critical activities in this table, A, B, C, and E, as well as their durations and standard deviations. After that, we use the equation on the left to calculate the expected duration of the project. It's the sum of the four numbers in the column of T. The result is 90 days. It means, on average, it would take 90 days to finish the project. We use the other equation to calculate the standard deviation of the project duration. It's the square root of the sum of the variances of the critical activities. The result is 4.7. Now let's find the probability that the project will be completed within 95 days. As I mentioned, there are many free online tools that can be used to find this probability. I just use this online normal distribution calculator. After we open this website, check area from a value shown on the right. Type in 90 for the mean and 4.7 for the standard deviation. Click below because we want to calculate the probability of t less than or equal to ts. Then type in 95 and press the Enter key. The result is 0 0.8563. This distribution image on the left is also updated. 
It means the probability that the project will be completed within 95 days is 85.63%. Now let's find the probability that this project will be completed within 85 days. The result is 0 0.1437. This image is also updated. It means the probability that the project will be completed within 85 days is 14.37%. This probability is smaller than the previous one, and it makes sense. 85 days is less than 95 days and it's more difficult to complete the project in a shorter period of time. What if we change this to 90 days, which is the mean or expected value of the project? After calculation, it shows the result is 0 0.5. This image is also updated. It means the probability that the project will be completed within 90 days is 50%. Since this is the mean, it means there is a 50% chance the project will be completed before this date, and a 50% chance it will be completed after this date. Okay, in this video, we talked about how to manage risks and opportunities. We discussed the purposes of contingent funds and time buffers. We also learned how to do a PERT analysis. This is Yung Wang. I'll see you in the next video.